Hey, you got a 700 R4 on the bench. We're going to tear it down, inspect it, see what's going on with it, see if there's any hard part damage inside, and if so, to what extent. So before I begin, I'll give a quick overview of the 700 so that folks have the context. Uh, these transmissions were introduced in 1982 and installed in various GM trucks, cars, SUVs until into production in 1993. And there were two distinct generations of 700R. There was the first generation, uh, which ran from 1982 to early 87, and then second generation, uh, which began in 88 and lasted through to 1993. So the defining characteristics that separate or differentiate each generation are gonna be the auxiliary valve body, which GM introduced in 88, or actually was actually introduced in uh, late 87 and became, you know, standardized across all of GM cars and trucks in 88. And then uh, the significant changes of the valve body itself, you know, the main valve body between early and late generations. So each generation can be further subdivided into two vintages. Um, for first generation 700s, there is an 82 to 84 vintage, which um, is defined by the 27 spline input shaft and correspondingly narrower pump stator or stator bore. Uh, under no circumstances do you want to use an 82 to 84 700 for any kind of performance or heavy duty application. Those 27 spline uh, shafts were notoriously weak and had a reputation for failure and it's well deserved. 85 to early 87 is the second generation and uh, 85 saw the introduction of the 30 spline input shaft and that shaft actually went through um, not only in the production of 93 at the 700s, but was carried forward into the 4L60E until uh, 2000 when the um, uh, Gen 3 small block was introduced. They had to change the stator and the design of the pump as well as the converter. Um, you can retro an 85 to early 87 pump and drum into an 82 to 84 unit and have it work. And so if you know your 82 to 84 is all you have access to, or you know that's just what you're working with, um, you can beef it up and make it stronger um, by retroing the uh, pump and drum from an 85 to an early 87. You cannot retro a pump from an 88 and up 700 as the circuitry is different owing to the uh, presence of the auxiliary valve body. Now 88-92 is one vintage in the late generation and then 93 is kind of a standalone. Um, in 88-92 uh, they eliminated in the valve body the uh, valve train and uh, bore location for the mechanical torque converter clutch lockup. So um, 82 to early 87 uh, those valve bodies were provisioned for that but 88 and up it went away. Uh, they eliminated the casting and the bore entirely. Uh, so you can retro, or excuse me, you can prospectively install an early generation 700R4 valve body into a late 700R4, second gen 700R4 case, but you cannot retro a uh, late 700R4 uh, valve body, in other words, 88 and up, uh, into an 82 to early 87 case. It just simply won't work. There's too many design changes. So I'll do a separate video on valve bodies and interchangeability and the, you know, you'll see the differences in valve trains and design and all that uh, when we dive deeper into the valve body at that time, but just know that up front for now. So if you want to know what year 700 you're working with, and this is you know going to be applicable to those that are looking for these for project cars or to swap out a like a three-speed or two-speed transmission or whatever, and um, you want to know like you know which which 700s are going to be the best to work with, the most obvious cue is going to be the passenger side where you see the large upside down U cast into the case just above the servo bore. So if you see that, then you know you're working with an 88 and up case. Uh, that casting um, uh, crease, if you will, was carried forward into the uh, one-piece uh, case designs of the 4L60E and ultimately went out of production in 97. Then if you want to know specifically what year you're working on, what you would do is you would go over to the passenger side pan rail and you would take a look at the alphanumeric code that's present on there. And as you can see, 
this has a number two. So if you see a number two and a number three and it has the crease, that upside down U-shaped crease above the servo board, then you know you're working with a 1992 or 1993 unit. If it lacks the crease, then in also it has the 27 spline input shaft, you know you're working with a uh, 1982 or 83 unit. Okay, so that's kind of a quick overview of the 700, give you a, a little bit of information, kind of begin your research if you're you know, looking for one for a project. Uh, so let me kind of get set up, I'll reposition the camera, get all my tools ready and finish my coffee and then we'll tear everything down. All right, I think I have all the tools on the bench to start tearing down the transmission. I mean, I say I think uh, because it's inevitable that, like, when I, once I get into it, there'll be some tool that I'm looking for hunting that obviously I don't have here handy. And, you know, I mean, it, it wouldn't be a proper teardown video if I was fully prepared. But that said, you don't really need um, hardly any specialty tools. In fact, the only tool you're going to need to tear down the unit is the uh, low reverse piston return spring compressor which is this tool right here and you're only going to use that once. Um, you will need something to compress the return springs in the drum so I shouldn't say that's the only one but you know in the same vein um, you know you can use either use a foot press or you know a, a standalone compressor tool or something like a, a, a vice mounted unit. The only other specialized tool that I'll touch on is this uh, governor board checking tool and Every once in a while, a transmission will come in, you know, 700R4, uh, where the complaint is that there's like erratic shifting, uh, no upshifts, or inconsistent upshifts, downshifts, etc. And, you know, when we check the governor, it's fine, it, you know, the valve moves and there's nothing wrong with the teeth on the gear. Uh, the valve body also checks fine, you know, no valves are getting hung up or whatever. Um, I'll suspect the governor bore itself to be the source of the problem, and I'll put some air into uh, this side of the checking tool once it's inserted into the bore and if I hear air coming back you know kind of blowing by I'll know that that bore is worn out and I'll have to ream it and install a repair sleeve so that that problem doesn't reoccur. Uh, I'll do a separate video on that kind of show you um, you know how that all works and you know the process and I'll annotate the video with the special tool you'll need uh, along with you know where to get the, this checking tool if that's something you want to grab but um, suffice to say for now, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call it a common problem, but every once in a while, I do see it. Before you start taking stuff apart, first thing you want to do is grab the input shaft and pull on it and push on it. So push it in, pull it out. What you're feeling for is end play. Uh, Spec calls for between 15 and 35 thousandths end play on these units. Uh, and that feels very, very, you know, like a very, very little bit of movement. But you can feel it. It shouldn't be zero end play where you can't, you know, move it at all. But it should also uh, not be such that you can push it in like an eighth to a quarter of an inch. Uh, if you can push it in that much, then that should tell you that the uh, forward thrust bearing has broken apart and failed. Again, not a common issue, but um, I see it mostly on rebuilt units where the end play was uh, set up to be too much. So maybe it had like 40 or 50 or 60 thousandths uh, worth of end play because the incorrect uh, selective spacers were used or they didn't shim it. Um, but either way, um, it's not the end of the world. You can still you know, purchase a transmission. Just know that you need to, may need to replace the drum. You may not, but you know, 50-50. The other thing you want to look at, especially if you're shopping on Craigslist and you're taking a look at cores or you're at the wrecking yard, is the splines here on the input shaft. Um, if these splines are worn, they'll look really, really thin. Okay, and if they look real thin, then you know you go to install that transmission after you rebuild it. What'll happen is the uh, male splines here will strip. Uh, the converter female splines will strip the male splines completely and you will have no movement in any gear. So if this happens to you just during a normal course operation, uh, you have no movement, no reverse, no forward movement in any range setting, then uh, what you're going to want to do is uh, first take a look at the dipstick to see if the pump is circulating fluid. If it reads full, 
and you know where you put a pressure gauge on it and you know there's pump pressure then that would lead me to believe that these splines have stripped First things first, let's get this dipstick out of the way. And then we're going to take these uh, cooler line fittings off, at least the, uh, the line side itself. So half inch wrench. You can use uh, line wrenches for these, but you can also use regular wrenches. Most of them will come off fairly easily, you know, with a hammer and a wrench like you see here. Next, 10 millimeters on the detent cable. And whatever you do, do not reuse these detent cables when you go back with it. Uh, unless you know that that cable um, was recently, you know, purchased or is otherwise new. Uh, the problem with these is over time uh, they, you know, kind of stretch and they'll lose tension so that when you set this TV up for the first time, got you all your pressure is good to go and everything's verified to be okay, you know, over, you know, 15, 20, 30,000 miles later this, um, this cable will start to stretch. It won't snap on you or at least, you know, it's not very common that that happens, but uh, if it's allowed to stretch, you'll lose your adjustment and, you know, the first casualty is the 3-4 clutch pack, you know, that'll burn up. So, always replace the D10 cable or TV cable, whatever you want to call it. Um, they're cheap, 15 bucks or whatever. And that will at least eliminate that as a uh, source of problems. Alright, next we'll tackle the servo. If it's all caped and gumped up like this, it might take a little bit of effort to get it out. All right, finally got it out. So, for issues with uh, slippage in second and fourth, first thing you want to check is the servo. Sometimes um, these Teflon ceiling rings will get pinched, especially if you have slippage, you know, right away on reassembly. 
you know, or once it goes back in the vehicle. Um, it's, I don't want to say it's common, but like it's um, not difficult to do uh, with respect to pinching one of those um, Teflon rings and you'll experience slippage in either second gear or fourth gear. So this is the second gear apply piston. Uh, this is what we call the 553 piston owing to the last three digits in the, uh, in the casting for the part number. Uh, these I would never use for a performance. I would use at minimum an 093 or Corvette servo. It's got a lot more apply area. Um, and then the fourth apply piston is the same for any year making model 700R4 or 4L60. Uh, again, same deal. Check the uh, Teflon rings. Um, make sure they're not pinched uh, when you go back with it. You do your air checks and we'll show you how to do that um, on reassembly. Check the spring, it's usually not broken. Um, it's pretty rare that I see these actually, you know, damaged in any way, but um, if your, you know, if your band burns up and it feels like it's kind of binding, you know, you know, at some point uh, before it, you, you totally lose second and fourth, you know, it's possible that that um, spring was broken. Okay, uh, 15 millimeter bolt here on the selector shaft nut. Seven sixteenths here on the pressure tap. Um, this is where you're going to plug in your line pressure gauge when you go back and reinstall the unit. And um, you know, once you have it filled with fluid, you're going to validate that your TV adjustment is correct based on the line pressures you see uh, at idle and at stall. So seven sixteenths. So an overwhelming majority of 700R4s had a uh, four plug or four prong case connector, um, except for the 93s. The 93 units actually had a five uh, prong connector and it's round, it's not square like uh, 92 and back. Um, to my knowledge, the only uh, vehicles that got a uh, 93 700R4 were the Corvettes and the F-bodies. Uh, I believe everything else at that point had transitioned over to the 4L60E, and then in 94 and up, the VETS and the F-bodies moved over as well. And if I'm wrong about that, I'll annotate. All right, we'll get rid of the governor cover. So the first thing you want to look at here uh, is the cover itself. Make sure the cover is not dented in this area. Uh, reason being is that you see this little, you know, this little um, uh, boss right here. This sets the governor's end play or you know longitudinal travel. If this cover is bent, then that governor may bind up, and then you, of course you'll have shifting issues. So if you have a, you know, cover that's kind of caved in, you want to replace it. Okay, check the governor itself. 
The main thing you're looking for is freedom of movement in that valve. So when you're actuating the weights, you want to see that valve move freely. And then you want to check the uh, gear itself. Um, as a matter of course, I just simply replace these gears, put a brand new one in. But um, if yours is in good shape or you can't find one, then you know you can uh, you can rerun it. But um, you know you can just feel along the surface, and I could see some wear on this gear, so no big deal. It'll be replaced. Governor will be disassembled, and then if you're doing a high stall or high performance application, you're going to want to get a governor kit so that you can change out the weights and the springs. And then uh, the other thing you can do if you can find one is install a Corvette governor, which uh, has a completely different uh, set of uh, weights on it. In fact, this entire section here is, is cut out and it's just, you know, skeletonized. So that's uh, designed to create a, uh, you know, later shifts in the RPM curve so that, um, you, know, it, you know, it'll coincide with the VET's, you know, higher performance engine and, um, higher stall converter, in, you know, that was put in there from the factory. I'll do a separate video on um, setting up and reconfiguring governors, disassembling them and, you know, installing new gears and cleaning them out and all that good stuff. But, uh, you know, that should tide you over for now. Ten millimeter on the speed sensor. Yeah, so this is what they all look like, um, you know, in the uh, second generation of 700s. If you're working with uh, a non-computer controlled vehicle and you need a mechanical speedo, you can retro a mechanical speedo, uh, or I should say you can install a mechanical speedo setup, um, you know, in any model year 700R4. Uh, when we get to the, uh, you get the extension housing off and the output shaft exposed, I'll show you where, um, <clears throat> you know, you can remove the uh, existing gear and replace it with another one, uh, the drive gear that is, so that your speedometer is correct. Okay, 15 millimeter on the uh, extension housing. Come around to the other side to get that last one. Not much to say about the extension housing, otherwise, um, you know, make sure it's not cracked or, or whatever. Make sure you replace the bushing and a seal, obviously. So here's a mechanical speedo. This is the drive gear. Um, you want to check and make sure it's not cracked, chipped, worn, otherwise broken. Uh, you can usually get these off fairly easily once the output shaft is out. Um, if you don't have like a specialized puller tool, but all you're going to do is collapse the little retainer right here and then pull the gear off um, either with a, you know, like I said, a puller or you can tap it off with a drift punch and a hammer. millimeter on this little bolt for the uh I'm actually not sure what it is. I think it's for um for wires. I'm going to get that rear trans mount off and then we'll uh, get into the pan. Yeah, 
Yeah, let's let's try to take it off without the socket. <laughs> Obviously, replace your rear trans mount. It looks like that. But don't forget the uh, two spacers. Thirteen millimeter for all the pan bolts. There's sixteen of them. Looks like the pan's been off so that the uh, fluid could be drained. This thing came from a salvage yard, so I'm not surprised to see it filthy like this. In fact, I'm a little surprised to see it not as filthy, especially on the top of the bell. I mean, most of the time they're entirely covered in grime. Okay, it's got its magnet. All the bolts here are going to take uh, 10 millimeters, except for the bolt here on the auxiliary valve body, closest to the forward accumulator. That's going to be an 8 millimeter bolt. And then you'll notice the little gold bolt here that holds the uh, transfer tube in place on the aux valve body side. Uh, that's where that goes. So you just remove the wiring harness, pull off the uh, torque converter clutch lockup solenoid, and then we'll get into the rest of the valve body, taking everything off. Uh, 13 millimeter on the um, uh, on the detent spring. There's no particular order in terms of like, you know, where you want to take the bolts loose from. I uh, just work from the outside inward and then when I um, reinstall them uh, these valve bodies I just start with the center bolt and then I just you know work my way around for torquing everything up. Again to my knowledge I don't believe that's uh, that's a required procedure but it's just more of a habit than anything else. These harnesses, generally speaking, are okay to reuse provided that the insulation isn't cracked um, or that there's not any obvious signs of damage. But if you do see damage or the insulation is you know, all cracked in a whole bunch of places and um, you know things are broken and whatnot, you may want to just replace it.
Now we'll get that center bolt in for now. So here's what I was referring to earlier with respect to the um, provisioning for the mechanical torque converter clutch lockup uh, valve train. Uh, these later Gen uh, 704 valve bodies were not provisioned for this. As you can see, it's just completely casted over. There's nothing there. So in the earlier variants, um, there was a valve train here. And hot rodders like that because they don't have to run a um, mechanical, electro, internal, external lockup kit to deal with the torque converter. Uh, all they have to do is purchase whatever kit they want from either Transgo or Superior or whomever uh, else makes them and then, uh, you know, set the lock up from there and that's it, it's done. And now I'm gonna take off the auxiliary valve body. So, two 10 millimeter bolts and then one eight millimeter bolt. Here's our 10 millimeter. All right, we'll uh, disassemble that later, but uh, the auxiliary valve body's only purpose was to introduce the Ford accumulator circuit. And GM did that so that you'd have a little bit softer engagement um, in and out of forward gear. For L60Es, they designed the valve body so that it would integrate that forward accumulator circuit into the main valve body, hence the reason why there's no auxiliary valve body in the 4L60Es. Okay, one, two accumulator. This is a common issue, broken springs. So if you have late harsh upshifts from one to two, then you can suspect that the, the spring might be broken. One thing you wanna be mindful of in here is the bore itself. You wanna make sure that this bore is not uh, scored up. I've seen that plenty of times, especially when the fluid has never changed. You'd have the bore all scratched up and what that would do is it would eventually wear out the seal or cut it and then you'd have a massive leak in the forward accumulator circuit. Uh, the other thing you want to do is make sure that the uh, pin itself is not overly worn here um, where the uh, piston goes. You're not going to inspect the piston because you're simply going to replace it. This transmission has been worked on before. So what this uh, stripe indicates here is an 88 and up unit. 
or a unit that takes an auxiliary valve body. So, as I mentioned earlier, they were also um, installed starting in late 87. One thing you notice right away is you have a bathtub here on earlier units. Let me see if I can get that to show a little bit better. So on earlier units, there was a check ball here. And in the spacer plate, um, you'll notice right here. Okay, if it would cooperate. There was another round hole right next to this one. And when you see that, if you see two round holes, then uh, especially if there's a bathtub underneath, then that would imply that a check ball goes there. Uh, almost invariably, that's going to hold true. In this case, because we have a, a square hole, there's no check ball there. And then you see the rest of the check ball locations. This one large check ball here is the TV safety valve check ball. So in other words, if your TV cable does snap, you know, or breaks, or you lose the ability to generate line rise upon acceleration, this ball will seat onto the um, valve body in that, in that uh, TV valve bore area, and that will max the line pressure so as to protect the transmission from failure. A lot of builders don't reinstall that ball. Uh, I generally will uh, if it's there. Sometimes it's not. Um, so it's just like one more you know, safety measure just in case you lose the, uh, you know, you lose the TV cable for whatever reason. Okay, same thing with the uh, 340. You want to make sure that the pin itself is not worn out or otherwise damaged, like maybe by heat. And for 3-4 accumulator piston, uh, again, you're going to replace it, so no need to check it. But it's common for the piston to accumulate uh, wear here in the board, and same with the 1-2. And that's why you're always going to replace them uh, on overhaul. A lot of times what folks will do with the 700s and the 4L60Es to firm up that 3-4 shift is to stick this uh, old piston back in the bore and then they'll stick a brand new one on top of it with the seal and that will firm up the 3-4 uh, shift nicely. So we got one, two, three, four check balls in the case. Uh, sometimes this reverse check ball for low reverse is missing, that's okay. Uh, this was also installed as part of the um, auxiliary valve body change to again soften that engagement to and from reverse and forward. Some builders will omit it just as a matter of course. Um, I'll leave it there if it's there, but if not, I don't sweat it. You pull out your band anchor for your 2-4 band so it doesn't get hung up when you try to pull out the drums. And then here's your 3-4 accumulator check ball. Like a, a lot of guys might tell you that using a magnet on check balls might magnetize them, but I found that not to be the case. Um, I've never had an issue with, you know, magnetized check balls creating problems inside the transmission. Thirteen millimeters here on the uh, parking rod guide plate. And a 15 millimeter wrench for the selector shaft retaining nut to the rooster comb. Thank you. 
if the selector doesn't want to come out, just take a pry bar and wedge it. No big deal. Sometimes they come out easy, sometimes they don't. For the case connector, all you're gonna do is pinch these two tabs in to pull it out, or push it out I should say, if you wanna reuse it. And it's got a little pry point on the other side where you can stick a flathead screwdriver, but I never reuse these, I always replace them. The thing really doesn't wanna stay put. Okay, I'm going to reposition the camera, spin this thing around so that we can get inside the barrel of the case and evacuate it. Okay, 13 millimeters on the pump bolt. Or bolts. Looks like that friction ring's really wearing out on that impact. Okay, we'll uh, do a deep dive into the pump in a little bit. Same with the drums. So here's the band. So, this surface here on the reverse input drum is gonna almost always be a little bit warped. Uh, to what extent, you can take a straight edge, you know, like a small roller or something with a flashlight and shine it, and we'll do that when we tear this down. But uh, if you're doing anything performance oriented, it's strongly recommended you just simply purchase a new drum. They're not that expensive, uh, 45, 50 bucks. And the latest square hole, large square hole design of the 4L60E will retro back into any uh, year 700 R4. All right, we'll dig into these two drums in a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay, bands. Again, for high performance, you want to use a wide 2-4 band, especially if you're replacing the drum or machining the existing drum. And a lot of times, I'll machine the existing drum if there's nothing wrong with it. And that's so that I can set band clearance exactly how I want it. And I know that um, I could dial it in, you know, basically perfect. I got a separate video on ideal band clearance using a 4L60E, but the same principles will apply here with the 700R4. For its tongue gear, so with all gears, I mean this is going to be universal, um, if there's any splines, check them. Uh, check your teeth, make sure they're not overly worn, make sure they're not real thin. If your teeth are, you know, real thin and you see like a lot of shiny high spots, or not high spots, but shiny spots, uh, you may suspect that the gear is overly worn and you may want to replace it. Always replace your bushings. Um, 700 R4, 4L60E are not super sensitive to bushing wear other than at the pump, particularly the pump body and uh, uh, rear pump stator bushing. And I'll get more into that in a little bit when we go through the pump. But <clears throat> suffice to say that for gear train, there's not a lot of bushings uh, in general in this transmission compared to many others. and uh, you don't see too much in the way of wear on the sun gear, uh, the forward sun gear. The rear sun gear is a little different story that's usually worn out.
These snap rings come in the kits, so you don't need to reuse them. So here's your intermediate shaft, here's your forward ring gear or hub, and then of course your front planet. So this washer looks relatively new, like it's been replaced. Like I said, I think this unit's been worked on before. For 03 and up 4L60Es, they eliminated this washer uh, that went on the sun shell. They didn't change the sun shell, but what they did do is they changed uh, the bottom portion here where the uh, thrust washer surface is and they um, cast in an additional step to locate a bearing. So 03 and up, uh, this surface here is rollerized. It'll retro back into any year 700R4 and it's something I always do for performance. So this bushing will get replaced. Uh, points of inspection are pretty straightforward. You're looking for any kind of uh, gouging, scoring, or burn marks in this area. Uh, if your uh, your planet has failed, like lack of lubrication is usually the issue, and this journal gets all chewed up, then you know uh, the bearing will fail, and then you'll see you know all kind of damage here and on the planet. Uh, splines, check them. Again, you want to check your splines here. It's common. Um, to see these splines particularly worn out and if that's the case you'll get like kind of a little bit of play there and um, you know if you install any kind of high performance application then you'll have a failure and I had it upside down but uh, this is right side up uh, bushing here it does get worn it gets replaced no big deal ring gear you want to look for um, flattened lugs, lugs that are overly worn, lugs that have a lot of deep grooves in them, uh, a lot of deep grooves in them, cut into them by your 3-4 clutch pack. And in cases of extreme lubrication um, failure related problems, uh, the 3-4 pack will actually weld itself to this hub. And I mean, you, you can eventually get the drum out, but it'll take a lot of effort. Inspecting planets, it's going to be all the same story with any planetary carrier you inspect. It's got a captured bearing, make sure the bearing turns smoothly, it doesn't feel like all granular or like there's, you know, um, sand or whatever floating around in there. If that, you know, if that's what it feels like, then you're going to need to replace the uh, pinion uh, or the whole assembly rather, or rebuild it. Uh, journal. Same deal, inspect the journal, make sure it's not scored, make sure there's no gouges, no heat damage. Um, you want to check the pinions themselves, make sure there's no heat bluing. Uh, I see that sometimes, uh, both in the front and rear planet. You'll see like, you know, bluing or purplish marks. If you see that, then the housing has sustained heat damage and I certainly wouldn't reuse it. Planets, check them for side play. Okay, you want to make sure that <clears throat> There is no side play present. You also want to check them for vertical play. I mean, there is a spec that you can, uh, you know, use with a feeler gauge to check to make sure it meets that spec. I'm not offhand sure what it is, but I mean, I've done enough of these to where if I, you know, come across one and it has a lot of vertical movement, then I'll replace the, uh, you know, the whole thing. The gears, again, you're gonna check the usual things make sure each tooth has sufficient amount of meat left on it, make sure there's no fracturing. I mean, you're gonna have to scrutinize it real close. Uh, I don't see too many problems with the front planet on the 700s and 4L60s. I do see a fair amount of issues with burn up or planet failure or, you know, um, complete and total rear gear train failure with the, um, you know, with the uh, uh, rear planet sun gear and ring gear.
No need to inspect the sun shell because you're gonna replace that. Uh, that's pretty much something you do automatically. You install a hardened and heat treated version. If it's for high performance, you're gonna to wanna to install like a TCI-B sun shell or a Sonic Smart shell. Same principle, uh, they've rollerized both surfaces, if, assuming you're also using the uh, late 4L60E 03 and up um, intermediate shaft that's rollerized. And that shell is also hardened, heat treated, and, and really strengthened in the area of the engagement splines uh, where the sun gear goes. Now, if you lose first, uh, excuse me, if you lose reverse second and fourth gear one day suddenly, what you can suspect is that these splines have stripped out or this neck has separated from the body. And as far as pattern failures with 700Rs, 4L60Es, that's one of the more common uh, ones to, to know about. And again, it's not, I wouldn't say, extremely common, like compared to say 3-4 burnup, which I would say 95% of all transmissions that come through this, this shop and many others, uh, you know, 3-4 failure is the, the reason for it. Okay, next is the center support. It's got a snap ring. And then you have your anti-clunk spring or anti-rattle spring. Yeah, what happened was this, uh, this part of the screwdriver blade that would normally grab the snap ring got cut off at some point and I haven't had a chance to fix it yet. Primarily because I've been lazy. Alright. Out it comes. Center support, your planet. The rest of your little reverse clutch pack. Your output shaft. And your ring gear with your bearings. Hey, same deal. Check everything. Check your your teeth. Check your journal. Uh, check the body itself here on the output hub. Check your parking lugs. Make sure that nothing's damaged. Make sure that the whole entire housing ain't cracked. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times I will see either cracked housing or damaged lugs when uh, you have vehicles that are frequently parked on grades. And, you know, who's ever parking the vehicle just lets the entire momentum of or weight of the vehicle, you know, more or less collapse onto that parking pole. Uh, I've seen the poles themselves damaged or broken off. I mean, that sometimes happens. Okay, so here's a closer look at the output shaft. And again, same deal. Check, you know, the area here where the, um, the governor rides. Uh, make sure the rest of the splines are in good shape. Um, if these strip, then again, you're dealing with kind of no movement conditions. Um, check the groove here on the, um, you know, the snap ring that holds the front planet in place. Make sure that uh, none of these teeth are damaged. Journals, check them. Make sure that none of the journals are damaged, scored up or, um, you know, dinged up, heat damaged, what have you. Okay. Um, when you go back with it, make sure that this lube passage isn't, you know, obstructed in any way, no debris in there or whatever. And then here's a better look at the gear. 
Um, it's real hard to get off of the punch when the uh, you know when the shaft is installed in the transmission, but once it's out, obviously it's it's very easy. You, know, you just collapse this, and then you take a punch and a hammer and tap it off. Okay, low reverse steels and frictions. And you have your waved plate. Okay, waved plate was added, um, I wanna say in 80, late 87 and up. Uh, they shortened the piston itself. The um, first generation piston was a little bit taller. You know, if you're sitting it upright on the bench, you'd notice a difference. And I'll show that separately, but um, there was no waved plate in the uh, earlier 700 R4s. So again, just one more thing they did to try to cushion that transition from reverse to drive or neutral or park or whatever. So check these lugs here. Make sure that none of these are broken. This is where your um, low reverse race goes, uh, you know, seats right in there. And then same deal with your, your outer lugs here. You wanna make sure that nothing's broken. This is where your low reverse clutch is spline onto. Check these splines. Make sure the splines are in good shape. And then of course, do your usual checks on the pinions. All right, now these are rebuildable front and rear planets. Um, if you wanted to take them apart, Replace the little needle bearings if they're worn out. If you have side play, I mean, that's what that is, is needle bearings. Uh, you can also, in a performance application, weld the pinions in place so that they don't come loose. I've seen that done. Bearings are usually reusable. Um, just make sure that they rotate nice and smooth. Again, you don't want to feel like that there's sand or grit or whatever in there. I mean, if they feel like that, especially, you know, given they're coming out of a case full of transmission fluid, then that tells me that they're shot and you should replace them. When in doubt, replace. Here's your little thrust washer. It goes here on top of the center supports in a race. The race rotates clockwise and then locks counterclockwise. Okay. I don't see a lot of failures associated with the low roller clutch. Um, I see them a lot in TH350s. Uh, if you were building a TH350, you can retro one of these center supports into a TH350 without any modification at all. Um, you know, just install a new uh, Borg Warner 4L60E or 700 low roller clutch, and you know you're good to go. As far as like performance um, options for the planetary carriers themselves, for any year 700R4 or 4L60E that did not already come with them, you can install five pinion front and rear planetary assemblies. Um, I would not recommend you install any of the ones that are available in the aftermarket. I would only use genuine GM OEM planets. Uh, the ones in the aftermarket have a mixed reputation. Uh, some builders say they've had good luck with them. Others have said that they've failed, you know, either out of the box or in relatively short order. All right, I'm going to get some of this fluid out of here, then we'll position the uh, spring compressor tool so that we can get at that snap ring and free the uh, low reverse um, piston return assembly. And then what we'll do is turn the case inverted and then use shop air to, um, you know, force the piston out of place and onto the cart. Hey, you got the low reverse uh, return spring compressor tool installed in the case so we can collapse that spring and then take out the snap ring.
Sometimes the snap ring will, or excuse me, the uh, return spring will get caught up there in the snap ring groove, so just tap it with the outlet shaft or a screwdriver and it'll come out. All right, gonna turn the case inverted and we'll blow the piston out with shop air. Okay, so where you wanna introduce air is right here in the low reverse circuit, and that'll blow out the piston. So there's three ceiling rings here. You have your center ring, and then you have your intermediate ring, and then your outer ring. If you're gonna have low reverse issues, slipping, and you know eventual burn up, uh, it's usually gonna be this center ring here that fails. Uh, I occasionally see this outer ring real hard as well, but uh, most often it's it's the center ring. So if you're looking at this piston, say you know on the bench like this. Um, and you have an early generation 700R4 uh, low reverse piston next to it, you'll notice that this is uh, shorter, you know, by eye than the early generation. And like I said, that was allow, or to allow for the um, addition of a cushion plate, and, you know, on, underneath the steels and clutches to soften engagement in the reverse. And I could have said that a lot smoother. I mean, I more or less butchered that explanation, but that's what it is. All right, a um, couple other minor things we need to attend to. So let's take out the uh, little seals for the dipstick and the TV cable. And then we have our selector shaft seal that has to come out. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go ahead and take a uh, Dura block and I'm going to sand the uh, worm tracks here. Uh, I'm going to spend about maybe five minutes or so, ten minutes doing that so that I know that this case here at this location is completely flat. Uh, you have again situations where there's some erratic shifting, um, you know, you're not sure what could be the problem. You know, maybe it's not staying in second or it's, it's downshifting when it shouldn't. A lot of times uh, there's cross leaks in the worm tracks. So this surface is not completely flat and you know if it's particularly warped then you'll have that problem. So I want to kind of checkmate that now so that we don't have any issues when we go back together with it. So I'm going to just use some 400 grit sandpaper and, and what you want to do is just go in like even motions. Um, I just go one direction. You know, do the best you can um, to prevent the paper from getting hung up. I mean, it'll sometimes happen. That got tore up.
right, this is the general idea of what you want to do. I'm going to have to get another piece of sandpaper before long, but just want to show you. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, have you watch five, ten minutes of me sanding this thing, but that's the general idea. It'll get the worm tracks flat, and then, you know, you don't have to clean it again or worry about contaminating it when you go back together uh, on reassembly. Okay, the case is empty. Uh, I'm going to go create some space here on the bench, get some of this stuff moved aside, and we'll go ahead and tear into the pump and the two drums. All right, now let's take apart the pump and then we can kind of go through some of the different points of inspection and issues associated with the pump and things you can do to kind of prevent reoccurrence when you go back together with it. 13 millimeter. All right, so first thing you want to inspect is the working surface. So looking at this, when I'm looking for a scoring, you know, any kind of deep cuts or ridges, any gouge marks, anything like that, uh, this working surface actually looks in good shape, um, which is somewhat unusual for a 700. Usually um, there's at least some scoring, uh, but I don't see that uh, at all really on this, uh, on this pump cover. And like I said, I think this is a, uh, been going through already at some point in the recent past, so I'm not entirely surprised. Alright, these um, these Teflon scarf cut rings, uh, you don't need a special tool to install them. So it's the scarf cut, just goes on like that. So one thing you really want to pay attention to with these pumps is this bushing right here. And this applies to the 4L60E also. Uh, if this bushing gets overly worn and or, you know, um, uh, there's contact between it and uh, the base of the input drum, you know, the shaft rather, then uh, what will happen is you'll get blow by here through the... Uh, uh, through that location and that will cause all kind of erratic shifting issues and in the case of 4L60E uh, it may generate code P1870 which in most cases is the valve body the torque converter clutch uh, regulator valve but um, the 700Rs and the 4L60E this bushing is real sensitive and like I said if it's worn out uh, you'll have torque converter issues or issues with drivability um, lack of upshifts and eventual possibly slipping and you know burn up of uh, the transmission overall. At least the forward drum gets uh, adversely impacted. <clears throat> you want to also check your stator splines, make sure they're in good shape. You don't want to see splines that are, again are real thin. If they're real thin up here and they're kind of um, almost triangular in shape, you're like an A-frame, then that means the uh, stator is worn out and needs to be replaced. Uh, I would just replace the whole stator pump cover assembly. Uh, this is a ceiling bushing here. This can also get worn out. Um, it rides here on the journal for the input drum. Get that in actually the camera so you know what I'm talking about. It's right here. So check your journals here. Make sure there's no wear. Okay, looks like we got some, I guess, superficial staining or what have you. Looks like that came off with just wiping it down. Take the boost valve out, boost and PR valve. So just some snap ring pliers. That's all you need. Here's your boost valve. 
Uh, there's different sizes of boost valve. I mean, the standard size is, uh, I'm not sure exactly how wide it is, but I'll annotate, but um, there's, a, there's this size, uh, then there's one size up, and then there's a, a larger size which you can purchase aftermarket, and that's what I always install when I go back together with these. Here's your reverse boost, your pump pressure regulator spring, and then the PR valve itself. Sometimes it get, can get hung up. It's usually not an issue with these seizing or, you know, overly forced drivability problems. I mean, they're, they're actually pretty reliable, uh, both 700R4, 4L60Es. Um, you can grind this land off to give you a lined lube uh, full time. So that's pretty standard in the 700s. So, and here's your lockup valve in here. And it looks like this one's gonna wanna give me grief. Why? Because I'm filming something. If I was not filming, this would not give me any grief whatsoever. It would just practically remove itself. Okay, here's your two springs. Got your inner and your outer. These springs are slightly different in the 4L60, so you just want to make note of that. Additionally, the valve itself is steel in the 700s. In the 4L60, they move to a um, coated aluminum valve. Anodized, I think, is the correct term. Hey, get your pump filter out. Make sure you don't forget to uh, reinstall the new one when you go back together, otherwise, You'll have no movement. You know, pump won't be doing much of anything. All right, that's the uh, stator pump cover. Now let's take a look at the body. So here's the body. Uh, 10 vein pump. Got your inner and your outer uh, slide spring there. I'm making a mess. So, oh, sorry about that. They switched to a 10 vein uh, setup, I believe, in 1988. I believe. Uh, 85 to early 7, I believe, were 7 veins. Uh, the rotor had only 7 slots in it. Uh, some folks actually prefer the 7 veins over the 10 veins because uh, they feel that the rotor itself is physically stronger, which I guess technically it is. There's you know less slots cut into it, but uh, the 10 veins were uh, developed to solve some of the um, inconsistent line rise issues associated with the seven vein pumps. I don't hear too many complaints um, one way or another about either. I mean, they'll both work. If you're, if you're gonna be doing a lot of real high RPM, like street strip racing, things like that, you may wanna install a billet rotor. These are powdered metal rotors and, you know, real high RPM, uh, especially if the, uh, you know, converter gets worn out where the lugs go, uh, you can get a lot of chatter, you know, and eventually these lugs will shear off. Uh, it's also common to have uh, these lugs get sh uh, shorn off upon reassembly because the converter slips off the end of the stator and the installer doesn't catch it. And then when you go to fire up the uh, unit, you get basically no movement, no line pressure, and, you know, pumps dead in the water. It's much more common with, uh, with you know, do-it-yourselfers that don't, you know, reinstall transmissions all the time. But the main thing is you want to be careful that, that that torque converter does not come out of engagement off of the stator and the input shaft splines. See if I can get this. There we go. Okay, there's an O-ring in here. Make sure you reinstall the O-ring when you go back to reassemble. 
pump body. Then you got your pivot pin and then your pivot pin spring, don't lose that. All right, let's wipe this down a little bit in here, and then we'll take a look. Let's try and get the camera to focus. There's a lot of glare. Okay, overall, you're again looking for a lot of the same things. Uh, any kind of scoring, very very light scoring. I mean, if it's really light, then um, you can maybe get away with some. Um, 800 to 1000 grit sandpaper, just work it over evenly. Uh, that may be sufficient, at least for stock or very mild performance applications. Uh, anything high performance, uh, you want to do a couple things. One, you want to just machine this, uh, the whole surface, uh, make it flat, true, and square again, 100%. Uh, you also want to install a Teflon bushing here for the pump body. And um, you also may want to consider, I mean, you can't see it, but there's the drain back location. Uh, you may want to consider drilling that out so that um, you have, you know, better feed back into the sump. Okay, like I said, you, you can't really see it with the seal in the way, but it's there. 700 R4s for all 60Es don't usually have a problem with um, issues associated with drain back. Uh, with the 4 LEDs, at least some early ones, you know, the earlier, you know, first generation, uh, higher RPMs, fluid would kind of dam up, so to speak, behind that seal and force it out. Uh, shift kits will have you drill that out to a quarter or five sixteenths, depending on, you know, upon application and, you know, to what extent you're going to push high RPMs through it. But for the most part, uh, the 60s and uh, uh, 700 R4s really don't have that problem. And now we'll take apart the two drums. I'll start with the reverse input, then we'll move to the forward. So, just a couple things real quick. Uh, there were three different drums in the 700R4. Uh, there was an early drum that took a steel piston and had a, um, had a cushion plate instead of a Belleville spring. Uh, then that evolved into a later drum, which is what we have here, that takes an aluminum piston and has a small um, feed hole, small round feed hole. Then subsequently uh, in the 4L60Es, uh, that evolved into a uh, drum that featured a large square feed hole and um, otherwise remained unchanged from this one. So the 4L60E drum will retro into any year 700R4. And uh, I typically always retro them back. Uh, the one other thing to note is that the uh, two pistons are not interchangeable between drums. Uh, the <coughs> steel apply piston and its respective drum, the area where the uh, piston sits is physically smaller in diameter, so um, you know you can't retro an aluminum piston plus. The older drum has a uh, bleeder ball, you know, somewhere in here on the surface of the uh, drum, but not the piston. The piston doesn't have any bleeder ball in it. Uh, with these aluminum pistons, they have a little bleeder valve or bleeder ball. I don't often see issues with the reverse input. Uh, usually, the um, you know the ceiling rings on the stator, which um, close off the feed circuit here uh, are you know undamaged uh, whether they're the scarf cut or the you know one-piece Teflon rings um, you just want to check in here make sure that you cannot feel ceiling ring grooves you can see them but you shouldn't be able to feel them if you feel them then you're going to want to replace the drum All right, so I mentioned earlier that you can check for drum warpage by simply using a, uh, a straight edge. Just stick it all on here on the surface and then you can shine a flashlight. Let me see if I could 
do it so you can actually see what I'm doing. Okay, so you just shine a light here. This drum actually doesn't look too bad. I mean, do the, do, your, do the best you can to hold the straight edge down while you're doing this. So, in a factory application, if you're going to run a stock band, you know, stock width band, you could, I could probably reuse this drum. Um, the only thing I would do is just take some maybe 600, then 800 grit sandpaper and just go over the surface with one sheet multiple times just to get it, you know, um, deglazed so that the band bites and holds it, you know, just a little bit better or whatever. But for performance, um, you want to machine this down to its, where it's perfectly fl uh, flat all the way around and so that you can run a wide 2-4 band that Altima makes. I mean, you can run Kevlar bands too, but I wouldn't recommend Kevlar on a street application. Uh, while they give you the best holding, um, you know, uh, you know, holding and clamping power, um, the best grip, they also wear the drum out uh, much more aggressively than, a, you know, a traditional band, uh, you know, like the Alto wide band. So I would uh, keep Kevlar to uh, either heavy street strip with a big focus on strip, racing applications or you know maybe if you're like mud bogging or Baja racing or something like that in a case of a truck or a 4x4 uh, that's when I would use a Kevlar band all right let's go to the foot press and we'll take out the uh, snap ring and then um, look at the piston If you're going to build a lot of transmissions, you definitely want a foot press. I mean, they're just a lot more efficient versus, uh, you know, bench vice mounted units or individual compressor tools that kind of fit into a toolbox. I mean, they make quick work of these uh, return springs. Some transmissions have uh, assemblies where the spring is is significantly large enough or you know significantly high tension that you're going to want to use a press but those are few and far between all right let's go back to the bench okay so here's the bottom of the piston you have your your two bleeder locations here and again the drum has no bleeder ball the other key difference that you need to know about is the uh, frictions themselves. Earlier, for that uh, you know steel piston equipped drum, the frictions were 80 thousandths thick. Uh, they tra transitioned to 70 thousandths thick clutch plates um, when they moved to the aluminum piston. Okay, as far as points of inspection, you just want to make sure that these lugs here are not scored. Okay, where you can't feel like you know cuts or grooves in them because you don't want these uh, steels hanging up you don't want the frictions hanging up um, again this is not a common thing by any stretch of the imagination I don't uh, really see it all that often I think maybe a small handful of, uh, of 700 R's 4L60 E's where that's been a problem uh, the only other thing I'll point out of a note I'm sorry for the background noise. Um, the only other thing I'll point out of note is you see these lugs here. You have different cuts. Okay, all that is is the factory balancing the drum so that it you know spins 100% concentric. Um, so if you notice the you know on other drums the cutouts are different. Some are shallower, some are deeper. Um, you know on the different. Um, main lugs between the engagement lugs for the sun shell 
that's all that is, is just balancing. All right, that's a reverse input drum. Not a whole lot of failures associated with this drum. Usually if you're slipping in reverse, it's that uh, center seal and the little reverse piston. All right, so now go ahead and pour a little bit of transmission fluid into this pocket. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take compressed air and we're gonna start introducing air into the apply circuit. So here's the uh, three, four. This is forward. And then this is your overruns. And what we're looking for is bubbles at the base of the shaft here. Okay, that's what we want to see. Or actually, that's what we don't want to see. We want to see no bubbles. So I'm going to raise the camera up and then uh, so that we can kind of look over on it while I uh, do the air check. All right, so now I'm going to introduce air into the 3-4 uh, feed circuit and we're going to see if any bubbles show up in the fluid. Okay, looks good, no bubbles. That's what you wanna see. Now we'll go ahead and test the forwards. All right, looks good. Now we'll do the uh, overruns. And normally when you're air checking the overruns, you wanna put a finger over the forward feed hole. Uh, otherwise, air will blow right out of it, but for, for what we're doing here, that's not necessary. Okay, no air, so, or excuse me, no, uh, no bubbles. So if you had bubbles, then you would know that this drum is no good and you'll need to replace it. Uh, a lot of times repeated three, four clutch pack failures, especially after overhaul, um, can be traced to this because the builder didn't check for it to begin with. All right, so I'll reposition the camera. We'll take the drum over to the foot press and we'll start taking out all the clutch packs and you know going through everything. I'll touch on different considerations for rebuild as well as points of inspection uh, when it comes to the forward drum. All right, let's start tearing into the drum, beginning with the 3-4 clutch pack. So, I believe at some point in the mid-80s, I don't know if it was 88, 87, GM started introducing what are called load release springs. Uh, for all I know, they may have actually been in, um, been in there since 82, but the principle behind these things is that uh, they kind of push the uh, pressure plate and apply plate away from each other so that there's no centrifugal apply uh, in this clutch pack when the transmission's in first and second gear. In my humble opinion, maybe not so humble, uh, they create more problems than they solve. Centrifugal apply was really not much of an issue in, in an overwhelming majority of uh, applications. For the most part, the bleeder valve in the drum itself, you know, kind of addressed that concern. So. 3-4 pack fails in this transmission more than anything else by far. Just want to check the pressure plate, make sure it's okay. This one's in good shape. Um, I mean, it's not even close, really. About 90-95% of all 704s of 4L60Es that require rebuild come in because of a th failed 3-4 clutch pack. So here are the springs. Now, with all that said about them, I actually do run them in performance applications where if I'm going to set the clearance down to about 30 thousandths what I'll typically do is pull one of the springs out of the you know the housing and then run it like that all the way around
Okay, let's look at the frictions in the backing plate, or the I guess this is technically the apply plate. All right, so let's take a look at the clutch pack. Through the years, there were different thicknesses of steels in the 700R4 and 4L60E. Uh, with the introduction of the 4L60E, uh, they introduced the thickest steel plates, which offhand, I don't know how thick they are. I think maybe 90 thousandths, but you can retro thicker steels into the uh, 700R4 any year if you use the correct uh, apply cage for the 3.4. And once we get everything out, I'll show you what that is and how you can identify a 4L60E uh, apply cage from the ones that come in the 700R4s. That clutch pack looked pretty good. Like I said, I think this transmission at some point was worked on, but it very well could be factory as well. You just normally don't see transmissions, uh, you know, three, four packs, if they're original like this, in this good of shape, unless there is literally very few miles put on them. Okay, so here's the forward clutch pack in its entirety, along with the input sprag assembly. So sprag rotation, free wheels clockwise, locks counterclockwise. We'll disassemble that and take a closer look at it in a minute. Okay, so here's our forward clutch pack. The wave plate's actually in here. Pull it out. The uh, overrun pressure plate wanted to come with it, but you'll have five flat steels and a cushion plate. It's not common that these are burn up. Uh, even if you have no TV or your cable is totally misadjusted, uh, a lot of times these will actually survive that. It's the three, four pack that gets toasted. And then here's your overruns and your bearing. So here's why I suspect that uh, this has been worked on before. You'll notice that A, these clutches are actually uh, 4L60E spec clutches, and B, this is a Viton seal, which um, I always recommend that for any 700R4 you build, you install a 4L60E Viton seal. Do not install or re, you know, um, reinstall the 700R4 plastic seal. Uh, that does leak, and it's worthless. Okay, pressure plate for the overruns looks good. Again, it's not common that these are burnt up. If you have burnt forwards, burnt intermediates, or excuse me, burnt overruns, I should say, uh, that could indicate a problem with the drum. That's why we wanted to do the pressure test so that we can determine if there, if there is issues, we can just replace the drum. All right, these frictions and steels look good. All right, let's uh, go ahead and set up the uh, press so that we can remove the snap ring and then take a closer look at the pistons. Now I'll say right off the bat, we are not going to be reinstalling these aluminum pistons. I would never recommend anyone reuse aluminum pistons. Always use the uh, 4L60E uh, bonded rubber and steel pistons from a uh, 97 and up unit because that will give you much more reliability in you know when it comes to the pistons in this in this drum So 700Rs and 4L60Es up to 96 took this uh, you know, early uh, return spring assembly, 
Later ones have a, um, a bottom here and it's, you know, kind of encased because the overrun piston does not have any um, little bosses for the spring locations. Okay, hey, don't forget about this O-ring down here. If you don't install that, you'll have third gear starts. Okay, here's your third clutch piston. Again, aluminum. Not gonna reuse it. So here's the uh, third clutch apply cage I was referring to earlier. You notice it has a number four on it. All of the 4L60E apply cages have a number seven. So, the legs on the number four cage are a little bit longer than the ones on the number seven. I mean, you can't see it here, but I guess just take my word for it. Um, they shortened up the legs or the overall height of, of this thing so that they can run thicker steels in the 3-4 clutch pack. So the number seven apply cage I just showed you is which is actually going to go back into this transmission when we assemble it. Here's your return spring for the three fours. Forward piston, forward piston housing. If you have a forward burn up, another likely cause is a cracked forward piston, very common, or at least relatively common uh, with these transmissions. And same with the um, 93 to 96 4L60Es. On reassembly, um, when you do your air check, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to um, any hissing, you know, real faint hissing sound that comes from deep within inside the drum. And what that hissing sound is, is gonna be the uh, air blown by the seal here for the forward piston. So, and this applies to aluminum pistons or bonded pistons. Uh, what happens is this, uh, lip seal will wear out and harden or and it will and it will begin to wear out the inner sealing surface of this piston housing so when it goes back in you'll hear air blowing by and that faint hissing sound is um, air rushing by that seal so if you see burnt forwards also suspect a worn forward piston housing And like I said, you're not really going to detect that until you go back together with it when everything is still dry and, you know, you're able to apply the, uh, the piston, you know, free of fluid and everything. Um, and that's true even if you soak your frictions. I don't, but if you do, um, you know, you'll still be able to hear that faint hissing sound coming from the forward piston. And then again, your overrun piston is going to be replaced with a bonded version. Bonded steel and rubber. That's what the uh, 4L60Es used after, or 97 and up, so after 96. All right, that's forward drum. The only other thing I'll mention is, kind of going way back in the beginning of the video, seems like a lot of time has passed since then, but you just want to check the splines. Make sure that the splines are not, you know, real worn out. Make sure they don't look real thin. Because if they do, then you're going to want to replace the drum because you run the risk of having those male splines stripped by the female splines in the torque converter. Now let's take a closer look at the uh, Ford Sprag assembly.
So these underwent an evolution uh, from early to late. Uh, the later, the later versions, including this one, um, had a wider inner race. Uh, they increased the size of the sprag. Early sprags were known for failures. So you're not going to reuse this, so there's no point in really inspecting it. But I mean, I could just tell by looking at this thing and feeling it, it's somewhat worn. I said somewhat. So points of inspection, the inner race. Let's clean it off real quick. Hey, you want to make sure the inner race has a mirror smooth finish. It's not gouged, scored, or um, you know, no signs of heat damage, things like that. This one looks fine. You want to check the splines. Again, same deal with the splines. Make sure that they're not heavily worn out. Uh, I don't really see failures too much here in uh, with these splines. They're you know usually pretty pretty reliable to be in good shape. So for the outer race. This is prone to wear, especially in either very high mileage units or units that came out of like, you know, heavy duty, uh, hard use applications. Um, if this entire surface area is mirrory smooth and shiny, like you kind of see the wear here on the uh, two edges. Uh, but if this center section is, you know, equally shiny, then you'll want to replace this. All right, otherwise, if the race is in good shape, but it's just, you know, has some shiny spots or what have you, just like this, what you can do, go all the way around, like some 200 bit sandpaper, and just kind of scuff it up so that you can restore that cross hatching. And that'll allow the sprag to, you know, better surface to bite into and reduce the likelihood of uh, rollover. In other words, where the sprag simply fails. Okay, you want to do it for about five, ten minutes. I mean, like I said, I'm not gonna. Not gonna have you watch me do that for that length of time, but you know, that'll give you an idea. So, like I said, this sprag, I believe, was replaced at some point. Um, these uh, retainers don't look factory to me. They look like, uh, you know, some of the same retainers that we see on the new ones that are coming out from Board Warner that are available now versus uh, what was available back in the 80s. All right. Um, just to reemphasize, never reuse this. Always replace it on overhaul. Okay, that is the uh, complete teardown of 700R4. Uh, I know it's quite a long video, a lot of information crammed in. Uh, there may have been a few things I've missed. If so, I'll annotate where applicable, but um, that should give you a, you know, a good understanding of what to look for, um, how to look for it, as well as rebuild considerations on um, when you go back together with these. Uh, I'll do separate videos on the valve bodies. I'll show you the differences between, you know, a first generation valve body versus a second generation valve body. We'll take them apart, clean everything up, reassemble them, and then we'll install a shift kit. This one will get a Transgo Junior, which is what I install on all these 700R4s, just primarily due to the uh, fact that they give you an updated TV valve and then some of the springs for the accumulators. So anyway, uh, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, go ahead and leave it below. Uh, thanks so much for watching as always, and we'll catch you on the next one.